My name is Andrew Fesnack. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of clinical pathology here at University of Pennsylvania, and I also serve as the director of manufacturing in our cell and vaccine production facility here on campus. Uh, I have nothing relevant to disclose. So today, I wanted to provide a broad overview of CAR T cells, and our learning objectives are to gain a basic understanding of CAR T cell biology and design, talk about current available targets, some common approaches to manufacturing these cells, and finally, I'll touch on future directions for the field. So let's begin in the beginning. What are CAR T cells? So CAR is an acronym that refers to chimeric antigen receptors. These are artificial molecules that combine B cell derived and T cell derived domains and functions. To understand why you might want a receptor like this, we have to go back to the basic biology of B and T cell activation. So you'll recall that a B cell receptor derives its specificity from its variable domains, uh, shown here in blue at the end of the B cell receptor. So when the B cell receptor encounters an antigen to which it has sufficient affinity, it can bind, can bind directly to this antigen, and then the B cell can have a number of downstream functions. It can produce cytokines, that B cell clone can proliferate, and ultimately that B cell can differentiate into a plasma cell, which can make soluble antibodies. Those antibodies can then double back and through opsonization, neutralization, or even fixation of complement, cause cytotoxicity against the target positive agent. Compare this to T cell activation. Here we have a T cell receptor, again, with variable domains that confer specificity. However, this T cell receptor, when it binds the cognate antigen, has to bind to that antigen in the presence and the context of MHC. So if the T cell, T cell receptor, is properly engaged, then the T cell can have downstream effects, much like the B cell. It can proliferate, it can produce cytokines. Those antibodies can then double back and through opsonization, neutralization, or even fixation of complement, cause cytotoxicity against the target positive agent. So relying on MHC to present a, a piece of cognate antigen actually has its downsides. Many virally infected and tumor cells downregulate MHC, rendering these cells resistant to T cell clearance. So if we were to design an artificial redirected killer cell from scratch, we'd want to combine the ability of a cell to bind to target totally independent of MHC, but at the same time cause direct cytotoxicity to T cell. And that's exactly what a chimeric antigen receptor does. But here in this figure, you can see chimeric antigen receptors as they evolved over the years. All the way on the left side of the figure, you can see that there is a B cell derived extracellular portion of a chimeric antigen receptor. Here it's depicted in blue, and they call this a single chain variable fragment. So this extracellular portion was actually derived from the heavy and light chain variable domains of a B cell receptor. In a single molecule, it's fused to the intracellular T cell signaling domain CD3 zeta. So what was originally found was that T cells expressing this chimeric antigen receptor showed an initial burst of response and then slowly lost uh, efficacy. Of course, those cells were becoming anergic. But later, adding co-stimulatory domains like CD28 and 41BB overcame this ener energy to allow the cells to become durably active. These are what allowed the cells to be put into clinics so quickly. So you can see that by basing your extracellular portion on um, B cell derived highly specific receptors, you can achieve high specificity and MAC independence. And it was the addition of co-stimulatory domains in cysts that allowed for durable activation. So knowing that the platform works, what are we able to target? 
And you can see here that there are a number of different targets that are under uh, investigation, targets that mark multiple myeloma, acute myeloid leukemia, as well as other B-cell lymphoma. But it's not just hematologic malignancies. Our T cells are now moving into target different solid tumors as well. So you can see that there's a wide variety of targets that are now being investigated. And what can we say that's common amongst these? So they're commonly extracellular, because as, as you'll recall from the design of the car, that single chain variable fragment has to bind to target, and that target is an extracellular domain on your target cell. In addition, especially with respect to solid tumor targets, it's become clear that there has to be a balance struck between sensitivity and specificity. So many highly specific solid tumor markers uh, are not conserved, either between different cases of a given tumor type or even within a heterogeneous single tumor itself. So choosing the right target for a specific solid tumor can be quite challenging. And striking that balance, uh, the, the proper balance might actually be tumor specific. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about how we actually uh, make these cells. Each protocol differs slightly, though so there are common elements to all manufacturing protocols for CAR T cells. By and large, it starts with a large volume apheresis from a non-mobilized autologous donor, it might actually be lymphopenic at the time of collection or even have circulating tumor. Uh, so the product itself might have few T cells or lots of non-T cell contaminants and therefore is likely to undergo T cell enrichment. T cell enrichment might take the form of a density-based separation like Baikal or elutriation or even an antibody magnetic bead-based separation. Once you have your enriched T cell product, that can be activated and modified. So the modification uh, often occurs via viral transduction or transfection of DNA and RNA. And the activation can occur via beads or uh, artificial antigen presenting cells that provide an activating signal to this T cell to uh, proliferate. And then the Proliferation occurs either in a standard culture vessel or in a bioreactor to reach a, a clinically meaningful cell number for infusion. Of course, these products are then heavily tested for quality control. We're testing for things like making sure that they've retained their T cell phenotype, that they are appropriately modified, and then the product isn't contaminated with bacteria or fungus. And then the product is then reinfused, completing the autologous cycle. So some major advances have been made in uh, CAR T cell manufacturing technologies. The original manufacturing protocols uh, were almost entirely based on adaptation of legacy instruments. These are instruments that weren't designed specifically for cell therapy purposes, or certainly not for uh, gene-modified T cell growing, uh, and they were modified or adapted to suit the purposes of their original protocols. It's been a, a quantum leap forward where uh, device manufacturers are now recognizing that there's a significant and growing demand for cell therapy-specific equipment and designing this equipment uh, for these purposes. But even with these new technologies, uh, we still have significant challenges achieving a, a meaningful dose. And really, the biggest challenge uh, is derived from the patient. So we have these autologous CAR T cells that we're manufacturing, and our starting material comes from patients with a variety of underlying diseases uh, in different states of disease at the time of collection and having been treated with often years of different modalities. What this means is our starting material uh, demonstrate significant variability, and that leads to some significant run-to-run -run variability. And this is unique to engineered cell therapy manufacturing. The amount of starting material variability that we can tolerate 
It's really unheard of in most other biomanufacturing processes. Uh, in addition, I, I showed some technological improvements that, that we've seen over the years, and the, the field continues to develop very rapidly. However, obviously, these new technologies come, come at significant cost. So finally, I wanted to touch on where the field is going and what the next generation of CAR T cells might actually look like. And looking across all of these different types of T cells, you'll recognize that um, the next generation of CAR T cells is going to be uh, CAR plus. So I say that to mean that there will be uh, uh, but the cell will be engineered to express a CAR, but either a heavily modified CAR platform or a CAR platform plus some other type of modification. And these additional modifications uh, are going to lead to some significant increase in CAR capabilities, but specifically I, I believe they'll increase efficacy, increase safety, and, and maybe even allow us to start with non-autologous material. Particularly when we encounter solid tumors, uh, CAR T cells encounter a number of limitations, specifically accessing or activating in the presence of tumor. So-called T cells redirected for universal cytokine-mediated killing, or TRUCs, are able to produce a large amount of cytokines, uh, such as IL-12, within target positive tumor tissue. And this, in turn, recruits innate immune cells which can destroy local tumor stroma. Other CAR T cells have been engineered to express chemokine receptors to enhance their homing into the tumor. And finally, checkpoint receptors have actually been ablated from CAR T cells, rendering them resistant to tumor-mediated checkpoint inhibition. Other CAR T cells have been reimagined to enhance safety through Boolean gating. Tandem cars and dual cars require the presence of two targets on the tumor cell to fully activate. Impressive cars, on the other hand, have a traditional car that generates a full activation signal, but also are transduced with a single chain that's fused to an inhibitory signal. So you can imagine that if normal tissue is expressing a benign marker, this car would not kill that tissue. Together, the goal of this, this advanced approach, is to enhance specificity and limit off-tumor effects, ultimately making a safer product. Our T cells have been called living drugs, and they pose particular challenges when you try to control their in vivo behavior. So some next-gen CAR T cells will most likely include off switches to enhance their safety. These might include uh, a unique marker to which a monoclonal antibody could bind and clear the cells, or expression of a, a pro-drug suicide gene. And, and still others are developing conditionally activated cars. It's a very exciting development wherein full activation of the car through signal one and signal two only occurs when an adapter molecule is provided. Draw the adapter molecule, stops CAR T cell activation, and could alleviate symptoms of overactive CAR T cells in vivo. Finally, as you recall from earlier, many of our challenges stem from the fact that these are autologous products collected from patients who've been treated for decades with all kinds of cytotoxic chemotherapy. And so one attractive modification would be to work with allogeneic T cells. So there are two major risks working with allogeneic CAR T cells. The first is that the endogenous TCR in an allogeneic T cell population might have affinity for the host, and therefore uh, transducing the cell population and infusing it into a host could cause severe graft versus host disease. Alternatively, highly polymorphic HLA molecules on the surface of these CAR T cells might be recognized by the host immune system and therefore rejected. So if you wanted to use allogeneic material, you may have to ablate or delete the endogenous T cell receptor and or HLA molecules. This has been called the universal CAR-T approach. There's a great deal of activity in this area. This is actually 
first tried in humans at Great Ormond Street Hospital, and now the efforts are largely being led by Selective. So you can see that they've targeted both CD19 as well as CD123, and they have other universal CAR T cells in the pipeline. And this is, this is a very exciting development, uh, given that it would change drastically our, how we approach manufacturing. So in summary, the next generation of CAR T cells is likely to combine the CAR T platform to make more effective, safer, and maybe even allogeneic CAR T cells. But here I've summarized our objectives and what we talked about today. And, and I'll just close by saying that this is a very exciting technology, but it's still rapidly evolving. So from day to day, we're learning new information about how to optimally do this. Manufacturing, at this point, is still a technical art, and it really requires um, significant flexibility in how you, uh, how you operate your facility, especially given the run-to-run -run variability uh, in the autologous product. Finally, um, the platform has proven really effective in some settings, but again, particularly when targeting solid tumors, uh, I believe that it will be the next generation of CAR T cells combining both the proven platform of CAR-T with uh, gene editing or um, third or fourth generation CARs to uh, really enhance efficacy against solid tumors. So finally, I'd like to thank all my colleagues at the Clinical Cell and Vaccine Production Facility, uh, as well as my uh, colleagues in the Division of Transfusion Medicine.